Achtung, Achtung. Welcome to We Have Ways of Making You Talk. And you may be able to tell from the ambience or possibly the sound of wind upon the microphone, um, not that kind of wind, that James and I <laughs> are outdoors. Um, James Holland, how are you? <laughs> I'm very well. Um, uh, uh, it's, I'm slightly embarrassed laughing at farting jokes. Well, yeah, but... but you know, they are funny, aren't they? Yeah, they are funny, though. I mean, this is a universal um, <laughs> a thing that I've relied on for quite a while. Now, so tell me, James, where are we? Put us well, all out of our we're, we're somewhere near Buckingham in the countryside, and... And you we're can hear my, mooing. There were cows, yeah, cows mooing. We're yeah. on a farm, um, and we're at my old mucker uh, Tobin Jones's place, where he has his track and wheel workshop, where he restores predominantly British kit, World War Two British kit, with yeah. Tom and various others. Um, and, and both Tom and Tobin have been on on the podcast before. We, I hooked up with them at Arnhem just after yeah. you had to scoot off home last September. Um, and, and and Tobin, Tom, and I go back a long time, and. They have just an increasingly impressive collection, well, and, have, and you know, if, if World War Two is your thing, and vehicles are your thing, and particularly British vehicles from World War Two are your thing, yeah, well, then this is well, heaven. I've not seen this much dark green outside of Bovingdon, I think. No. I mean, they, they, we are looking at um, uh, XF61 Tamiya dark green, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. absolutely but, everywhere. But we were going to come up here, weren't we, and, and yeah. do a podcast, but actually we're now thinking we're going to do three maybe four three because there's there's too much to to look at yes thank you for having us first of all um uh i mean i am brimful of envy um uh and wondering what can be you know how how easily you can trouser a piece of track (laughs) get it in my (laughs) overcoat so very basically how did you get into this Oh, uh, difficult uh, one that. Just as a starting question, then we'll talk about what you've got here. Yeah, um, I personally uh, got into it uh, just uh, by being a, a lad, you know, war picture library, uh, making models when I was a kid and all that sort of stuff. And so when I was a bit older, I just had this hankering. I thought, I want a tank. <laughs> and uh, I'd started a, a business. Reasonable, reasonable thing to. <laughs> yeah, to absolutely. Want, and uh, the business right, was a bit inadequate in my dodge. <laughs> <laughs> you got to start, start somewhere. So uh, in those days, you couldn't just go and buy a tank off the MOD. You had to be on a, a, a special list. Right. So I applied to be on the list, and that took about two years. And then out of the blue, I had almost forgotten about it. I received a phone call from um, somebody at the MOD to say, "You're now on the list." And by the way, there's what we think will be the last auction of a, of a vehicles happening in ten days time so you better get right. down there right. um, and I wanted a chieftain and I'd got this idea in my head and I had not researched any of it and I thought I could just drive it through the archway to my house and um, <laughs> and I was going to deactivate the gun myself Hi, honey, I'm home. It, yeah yeah surprise and so <laughs> yeah. I jumped in the car with my brother and we we drove down to where this auction was and luggishal and uh, we turned up and i was just gobsmacked by the size of all these vehicles measured up a um, chieftain it wouldn't fit uh, got looking a bit further and in the end i decided i could um, manage a, a saracen a six-wheeled yeah. armored personnel carrier yeah so i bought that got it home learned how to drive it learned how to fix it really was going in at the deep end and got this thing working the kids loved it we used to go camping in it and we'd go for picnics and and just great fun amazing the funny thing was actually a a driver for a parcel delivery company turned up at the house the other day and he said i know you and i said do you and so they had this little conversation and it turned out he'd come on a birthday party where we'd taken the saracen and uh, and gone camping when he was a little kid so um (laughs) so we started with that um i retired six years ago um, had got this collection of vehicles, um, had met this uh, slightly, slightly strange guy, Tom Cunningham, who was clearly a good mechanic, young yeah. lad, um, knew his stuff, and we, we hit it off, basically. Um, I got on well with him, so he started uh, by coming to work for me, restoring my vehicles, and quite quickly um, decided that I'd got bored of uh, being retired and that we would start up a business to restore these things. We like old British things, yeah. old British military vehicles, early war ideally, and it's gone from there. Well, I mean, uh, I'll just describe uh, the, the, the vista before us. So we're in a, we're, you know, out the back of a farmhouse. It looks like your regular farm buildings, uh, uh, large garages or sheds or whatever, but it's different because what we have is right behind me there's a sherman a sherman tank um in guards armored all seeing eye livery there's uh, a jeep in a state of um uh, restoration so it, it's in a it's in a sort of red pri- it's not oh it's 
It's, it's a Jeep. Uh, um, uh, in, in its red primer. Um, there's an ambulance behind that. There's various vehicles. And then... Um, uh, out towards the cows where the moon's coming from, and you cast your eye over a over a Cromwell hull with some wheels on that's in a state of, I mean, complete nut and bolt restoration, as I, you can see from here, down to the interior primer than the than the sort of red ship, red hull primer that you might see on a boat, with a turret up on stilts, and then in the to, as you make your way, your eye goes across. There's a cr there's a comet, a very very rusty comet. Um, uh, uh, out towards the field, and then various other sort of hulks and hulls, and I mean, there's a lot of rust on show. Yeah, but but it's all gonna it's all gonna <laughs> be reborn like the phoenix. Oh, no. So it's quite incredible. So d is everything we're seeing here that's in a finished state? W was it all in this kind of? Most of it, most of it, k comes to us as a rusty pile of bits. Uh, not all of it. Um, tint in the jeep you were, were were talking about. We yeah. we decided to keep that red. It, it came from the states, yeah. um, and uh, it's just in very good order. It just looks nice and rusty and, yeah. and rustic. But the other stuff um, comes into us. The Sherman tank, which is an M4 A4 with a multi bank engine, yeah. uh, that's something we were asked to acquire for a client, uh, and that will be going off to the client at some point in the next few weeks. We've got to make the gun inactive at the moment. It's a well, live gun. Really? Um, yes, yes, yeah. Um, we're we're, oh, we're registered. With me. We're registered Tell firearms me. dealers as well, so that's something right. that we do uh, the, the k2 ambulance behind you uh, that came in again pretty much in the condition that belongs to a, a friend of ours and a customer and he's opted to keep it like that for the moment it will get right. repainted the oh, that was it was that the one that was in arnhem last uh, up, up at um, the camp last year yes it was yeah, yes it's lovely that yeah, yeah. Um, a lovely example and so you you've got a uh, each one has a story uh, the, uh, the 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 comet over there was used as a um, a training aid for, by the army and they spent their time pushing it into a, a giant hole um, and then Fishing winch, it out. winching it out right. essentially and which is why the side skirts are all damaged but <laughs> the suspension all works because it's all been moved regularly and everything is there because nobody ever took anything off it so it never had a chance to rust shut then all the all, no. the, all those working parts no right. so although oh, wow. that looks fairly grim that's um a relatively straightforward restoration so aside from the um the comet there that there's a, you've got several several churchills uh, uh not churchills not churchills um, uh, uh, cromwells sorry <laughs> yes. um several cromwells on the go in different states of restoration haven't you yes so at the moment in the main workshop um we've got a centaur which was uh, the forerunner of the cromwell yeah. and that came to us as a bulldozer tank um, they were converted by um, MG in Abingdon in 1940, late 43, early 44. And the idea was that they weren't really regarded as combat worthy vehicles, yeah. but they were still good vehicles. And so they would put a big um, bulldozer blade on the front and they could be used for clearing wreckage in towns that, that had been bombed uh, to allow the troops to, to go through. So if the famously the gardens in Caen that are bulldozed to turn into roads Absolutely. Yep. would have been done with a vehicle like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, and also, I mean, they had gargantuan numbers of, of, of dozers full stop. I mean, yeah. it, it's amazing that, you know, you think about when you're sort of building up all the supplies for Normandy, you know, you just assume it's going to be tanks and guns and trucks, but actually another massive part of it is graders and dozers yeah. Yeah. so yeah. that you can clear away all this rubble that you've just destroyed. The yeah, armoured dozers tended to be used at the beginning when there were still snipers still about dangerous. and, and yeah, it was yeah. still dangerous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The but what we've done with that is basically remove all of the um, the bulldozer kit because it's just less desirable. In a way, it goes against the grain because it that's how it ended its service. Yeah. But it's a more desirable vehicle as a tank gun. Well, yes. I was oh, sorry, gonna, a, a gun tank. I was going to ask. Um, uh, you know, when you're restoring a vehicle, it's just sort of the English heritage question. This because um, uh, I've played lots of venues where they um, most famously there's Leeds City Varieties Music Hall where they did a massive restoration on it and it was falling apart. But they basically had to pick a year um, that they were restoring to because that venue evolved over the years. And so I think they picked 1898. So we're going to do what we can to turn it into that venue in 1898, but, but with modern health and safety standards. So they also, as well as, as well as the toilet doors being left exactly as they had been, they cut a great big hole in the front of the theatre to put a lift on to get wheelchairs in and out, and I, I, which are, I'm completely, so got no problem with that, but it's the sort of, it, how you make that decision, how you pick a year, how you, because obviously if you want to take it out, there's health and safety to consider in this Correct. day and age too, isn't there? 
when we when we start with these things if it's a client's vehicle we have to have a conversation with the client and see what they want there are levels that we're comfortable with and not comfortable so uh, probably the biggest one is asbestos um, right not so much the brake linings they're they're relatively easy to handle but there are places where you end up with lagging and it's nasty nasty stuff and so um, that's normally removed uh, completely from the vehicle and obviously not put back or rather modern equivalents are put back yeah. in place um, other things are forced on us so modern fuel is nothing like the old wartime uh, petrol uh, it, it, we well, call it's got it, no lead in it um, that's the least of the words it's what we right. call fizzy it, it's got a much higher um, burn ratio um, and essentially if it gets too warm it will evaporate the the petrol people spend a lot of their time pressing lpg into fuel and the reason is it gives a clean burn right but during the war they didn't care how clean it was um <laughs> they just were worried that sailors had to bring it across the sea and, yeah, yeah. and were dying doing it so the modern fuels have a habit of attacking various materials so copper and brass they don't like um it once they're together for any length of time they form a horrible silt diaphragms in fuel pumps tend to get eaten the old diaphragms right. so those need to be changed but there are other things we do as well we tend as a rule to if we can move over to modern electric fuel pumps yeah. because they're more reliable yeah. um, modern spark plugs are generally better than the old wartime ones uh, some of the wiring we will use modern yeah but uh, and but that's our preference if a client says I want absolutely the original that's how it will stay we tend to be thinking as you mentioned about the health and safety yeah. most of these vehicles they're to be driven on the road yeah. and, and, yeah, not, I mean, and enjoyed and enjoyed and, and not just be museum pieces and therefore they've got to be practical haven't they you've got to you i mean you know Correct. i know this from personal experience of my citroen you know it was it was great having it as six volts but but you need 12 because then you then you can use it much better because it will start much better and you can put a stereo in and all those sort of things that make it more usable on That's a day-to-day -day basis yeah i've got a stereo i've got a dab digital i've got the whole shebang yeah well, it's test match special that's what you're worried about yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. no obviously yeah you know you can't, can't, can't have a car where you can't have test match special I mean, it's, it's hopeless. so yeah and I, I can see that it's everyone's choice but i think the truth is is you you'll you'll tend to use it more if you know when you get in it it's going to start more chances absolutely than not and and that it, you're not going to have sort of endless absolutely modern paints are much better than wartime paints yeah. Yeah. they also haven't got lead in them yeah. um and uh, and they last much longer and if you're paying to strip a vehicle you want the paint to last as long so as possible over there there's the, that's a, a cromwell isn't it um Yes. To be. Well, to or be. As was and to be, and maybe, or was it a Centaur? That is a Centaur that's right. being converted over to a Cromwell. Right. Well, for the uninitiated. Yeah. What's the difference, James Holland? Well, the, the, <laughs> the Centaur was, was the only tank made for the, for the Royal Navy, wasn't it? Um, and it was a. Uh, is that not the case? Well, the Marines used them. First with I've a, heard of it, but I, a, you may well be right. The Marines used it with a, with a, with a builder building buster weapon on it didn't they? They, they that was a later yeah yeah i think that was the redundant ones yeah yeah, yeah. well but so the, but the difference is the difference is it comes along first it's the engine isn't it it's, that's the, the biggest difference biggest not difference. the meteor so they the hadn't got the meteor the, engines yeah yeah so it's a lib it's a it's a, a an aero liberty. engine liberty engine so well. the centrals are used by the army in the normal army way they were, but they were quite early, and so they didn't see any action. Right. Um, so, but but when you sort of go to Normandy, the ones you see are the ones that are being used by the Marines, aren't they? Yeah. Yes. Royal Marine yeah, Commandos. Yeah, 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 yeah. And there's a story yeah. with those because they were um, supposed to be providing offshore support, and they were vehicles that haven't got any engines in them because they were going to tr um, convert them over to Cromwells, but right. they haven't got the engines. So the bright <laughs> idea was they'd sit in landing craft and lob shells onto the shore, and Churchill heard about this and said. Well, Whoa, whoa, whoa. no no if you're sending tanks in put engines in i want engines in it's fair point. and what churchill said churchill got yeah and so they put engines in and they were operated by the navy but but Toby, around the corner you've got a cavalier as well haven't you which yes. is which is a precursor of the centaur and the cromwell correct and and that's an earlier version again with the um, liberty engine they were they were good tanks but they were in that process of evolution. Should we go and have a look? Yeah, because yeah, I, mean, I mean, what this, in many ways, what you've got here, you know that image of um, 
of the, that, that cliched image of the evolution of man, where there's, yes. little, there's a little cr- cr- crouchy sort of ape <laughs> figure, and at the end, walking tall yeah. is, the, is the finished product. And you've sort of got that here. Yes, with in, the Cromwell. With, 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 well, with, via the Cromwell. Well, the Cromwell's the, Cromwell's the sort of halfway up bloke. And the comedy the 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 is, the is Homer Sapiens at the end going, um, uh, I've he, arrived. Yeah, I've arrived. You rang, and of course he's, <laughs> he's late. But, uh, well, or arguably not. But um, shall we go and have a look at the Cavalier? Yes. Welcome back. Well, um, at first glance, you might think we're in a scrapyard here, Tobin, but we're not, are we? We're not. It's a fair comment, though. Um, we're in the <laughs> middle of our, um, I say graveyard, it isn't. It's our it's external, your archive. external storage it's your external area. archive. Yeah. Um, a lot of the tanks that we've got survive because they've come off the firing ranges. And that's what you can see here. Um, so in front of us, closest, we've got a Cavalier tank hull. Yep. Um, it did have the turret on. We've taken the turret off and the turret ring. Um, various, so where's that? Um, those are away being restored over right. the other side. Yep. And so you can see uh, there are a couple of shell holes yep. which have gone right the way through the vehicle. And those are modern weapons. But you can still recognise what it is. It's a Cavalier. You can see the sloped rear armour or where it was mounted. Yep. Um, the the track that's in there. The tyres have got the... Although it's not... a certain way of identifying cavaliers they've got the suspension holes drilled in the rubber right um but it's that one's that will be restored but there's quite a lot of work involved in that now, one um, yeah because that's a very different suspension system to your centaur over there isn't it um no similar remarkably similar. similar yes okay because the, the panels are the panels, well, the panels put, are on yes so, right so, so i suppose they're not over see, there you can't see the you know, got you. What yeah. you've got on each one is you've got a, um, a an arm uh, which is based on the early Christie suspension, yeah, right. which is which is bent and, and holds the the large round road wheel. And then inside, sandwiched between two pieces of armour, you've then got um, a, a large road spring, yeah. a series of rubber buffers um, and shock absorbers. Yeah. Generally, only shock absorbers on the front and the back. And one of the the th- the patterns that runs right the way through the development of all these vehicles is them trying to get the suspension right yeah. and different vehicles different weights and they literally there are reams and reams written about which shock absorbers how strong they are how strong the springs are where you put them at the front at the back where you put the big buffers where you put the little buffers um, that clearly gave them a lot of grief so so so, so the cavalier is, an, is is it's a sort of it's a sort of um if we are if we're extending this evolution analogy this is this is the thing that's that's neither neither chimp nor human being if Correct. You neither ape nor nor human yep. it's the thing in between uh, so it's it's like a it, i mean this it, it at a first glance it does share attributes with a cromwell i mean it's noticeably smaller correct um and and, and we're talking is, is it is it so in terms of length, width, everything? Uh, it's mainly in terms of length and the length of the engine bay. It was it right. was built that's around... Why, that's why it's sloping at the back. Yeah, built around the Liberty engine. And yep. uh, the Liberty engine, the way they, they packaged it, was just a little bit uh, shorter, or in this particular case. Things like the radiators were um, different size, uh, the clutch was a different size, it was a different gearbox, and it, it just meant that they were they were experimenting. It could be a little tidier. Because so, yes. so you've got so so this is these are I mean after all uh, we're talking about cruiser tanks here. Yes. So so th- there's th- in in British tank doctrine there's the, there's the, the sort of two. Um, uh, theories really that, that that you need an infantry tank which is a which is a which doesn't need to go quickly which which is a support vehicle for infantry and the matilda 2 is an infantry tank strictly speaking isn't correct it? with a two pounder it's providing that mobile firepower yeah. mobile pillbox and you have really. to a mobile well, pillbox first you world have to war work, style yes and you have to work with the infantry because the infantry are kind of eyes and eyes on the ground really yeah and then and then there's the cruiser tank and the idea with the cruiser tank is it's is it's uh, and, and the analogy is always with cavalry, isn't it? It's, it's your breakout thing. Or the naval idea, or, or, which or, or, is that it's a cruiser yeah. zooming across yeah. the sea and in and out of the battleships, yeah. doing its damage and, and disappearing yeah. quickly. Yeah. Um, which, of course, 
isn't quite what happens. No. <laughs> but, but so this is this is they're on their so what precedes this? There's the there's the uh, crusader, isn't there? Crusader, which is which is the thing with the funny diagonal um, sort of wedge shaped yeah. turret. And, have, yeah. and you see lots of them in the desert, don't you? Yeah. Yes. And I think they were they were experimenting with a mixture of engines. Yeah. Um, I think I'm right in saying that the crusader had the Meadows engine, which was a, um, a flat engine. Um, the combination of weight, the construction, the crusaders. I think I'm right in saying were all riveted yes um and so they were trying to improve rapidly because the war every time they brought one of these vehicles onto the battlefield unfortunately they were found wanting yeah and but so I think, but i think you, you know you've just said that they're, they're making these changes rapidly and that is the key there is this there is this persistent kind of sense that somehow kind of british tank production is, is sort of languishing in a kind of sort of old fart kingdom where they can't get anything done and actually that that's not the case, is no, it? I mean, Winter Cavalier, what, 1941? Yes, and it, it takes... And when does the Cromwell start? For, when does the Centaur and the Cromwell first? I mean, uh, 42. 42. 42, 43. And, and the Cromwell sort of in, is, is with its regiment by 1943, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, that's pretty quick going, isn't and it? And when you look at, the, at, at getting a number of tanks out to a fighting unit, yeah. the, everything that precedes that is a vast amount of work. You've got to design it, you've got yep. to prototype it, you've got to test it, and if all that's good, you've then got to produce well, it. Well, they do a big test don't they in, in 43 with Sherman's at, where they run a load of tanks together they drive them on a sort of 2,000 mile journey around the country and the and the Sherman comes out on top for reliability and repair repair time per yep. mile which is and reliability is one of the top components that, that's needed from the new um, the new breed of medium tanks that are being emerged, uh, that are being designed from kind of 1940, uh, early in 1942, the British start to say, you know, we need, we need to have, have new tanks. You know, the existing tanks we've got aren't quite right. You know, what, well, what is well, the priority Well, list? well, and what happens in the desert is, is because the tanks are so unreliable, reliability gets put above firepower. And ease of and maintenance. A, and ease of, yeah, those things yeah. get put above firepower and protection for the crew. And, they, and p- part of the reason why they became unreliable was they needed more powerful engines. Yeah. Um, and they put in those engines, but then they were stacking on more armour. And so, of course, the engines around, became around, unreliable. Around around and and yeah. the transmission, yeah. So all, all, the, all the tight I, circle. I mean, I mean, the cows are, cows are mooing their approval. Um, yeah. It's not the first time. Just been, it's the not the first time I've been mooed <laughs> off. Mm, yeah, <laughs> but, love that. Mm. But, but, but I think what, what I mean, what is in? I mean, after all, the thing is, is the Germans have this head start. They've been much more serious about tanks earlier, which is which is why there, there appears to be this lag. But the but the speed of development in in British tank design is is it's incredibly fast. And in the end, I mean, and we talked about the comet. They they kind of end up with a main battle tank. With a modern tank, with, with everything right, yeah, in that, yeah. By the end, so that. much so that when they actually incorporated all the lessons that went into the Comet, they then went on to the Centurion, yeah. which was, as you said earlier, the main battle tank for a, a generation. At least, after a, ge- that, at least, least a, a generation. generation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so it was it was a, a painful way of learning this yeah. whole process. Yeah. But so um, that's uh, the vehicle there, and and then following on from that, um, yeah. they they uh, essentially went on to the Centaur. And the Centaur was a slightly larger vehicle. Um, the suspension, bigger engine bay. Uh, bigger engine bay. The suspension squared off back. was different. Squared off back. Um, the, the, as I say, the suspension kept on changing all the way through. The armour. There, there were lots of things wrong with it. Um, the, the the turret armour wasn't as well secured as it could have been. They still were mucking about with six pounder guns, which weren't heavy enough. Um, uh, but having said that, they at that point they knew that they had the Meteor engine coming, and they knew that the Meteor was going to be good. Yeah. So they had built the Centaur with a view to upgrading it to um, the Cromwell, as it would become with the Meteor the engine. The Meteor engine, famously being a, a basically a Merlin. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, retooled to be used in a in a. It's a you, Merlin you've got de-stressed. One we, can start up, you, we have yes. Hmm. So Merlin no de-stressed. Way. So so, um, uh, I mean, I've read a little bit about this, but you're going to know a lot more about it than I will have read. So what, what's a de-stressed Merlin engine? How does um, that? They they derated it, uh, and by uh, to do that, they took the supercharger off, which yep. was the big assembly at the back, the blower. Yeah. Um, and they did away with the big. Um, carburetor which hung down below that blower and put a pair of carburetors between the V of the engine with a, a rather complex induction manifold and and that really is it right. so they reduced
reduce the power differing marks of, of Merlin would have been uh, at a thousand plus horsepower um, and the the first engine the mark 3 uh, meteor was rocking in at about 490 500 horsepower but in terms of, of engine block in terms of pistons all the rest of all it, the it's same. Exactly same all the same and in many cases um, aero engine parts were used in the early days and 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 I mean after all why not that engine is extremely well proven by this point they're, they're churning them out um, like like shortbread you know it, it's not it's it's not difficult to produce it's not difficult to modify so you you and also you've um because because part of the obviously the emphasis in the first couple of years of the war is air defense and and the strategic bombing campaign is is the air so you've you've geared you've geared a you've massive got your machine part, tools exactly you've, got, you've, you've got geared a massive part of your engineering effort to building this engine so why not stick it in a tank i mean it makes it makes perfect sense it's like and, the, and the skill base too yeah, the yeah, people yeah, yeah, knew yeah, what yeah. they were doing um they uh, put the production initially over to rover yeah. um and i believe that a deal was sorry correction i might have that the wrong way around um there was a swap done with rolls royce and um, rolls royce got the jet engine yes, which had been right. dealt with by rover and rover ended up dealing with yeah. most of the because well, rover were getting production. nowhere with the jet engine so uh, they, uh, they weren't of the same frame of mind yeah, yeah but they were into making engines yeah and that's what they did so right so that's the that's the that's the 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 beating heart of the tank the armor so you know the, the british steel um sheffield steel the shipbuilding industry Britain is Britain, the industrial revolution is synonymous with uh, steel development and, and obviously Krupp is the is the you know the, the famous German steel manufacturer what's the what's the armor made of who's making the armor and is it how good is it because after all that's the you know we talked about power plant because so we can do you I mean if you, you you work your way through a tank like this guy power plant and suspension then onto the armor and then onto the weapon so what's the armor like well, when, when we're working on these vehicles, um, one of the things that we found quite early on is that the quality of the armour, particularly on the early vehicles, the Centaurs, is quite variable. So, is that, is oh, that, really, from, from, from one to another? Is that oh, an engineering way of saying crap? Um, if you wanted a consistent piece of armour plating, yes, crap. Um, <laughs> in that, um, if you were drilling a hole in some places uh, on the same piece of armour, um, uh, really? pretty much a Woolworths drill bit will just sink into it without any problem at all. There are other places where the, the surface hardening is so good that even with a carbide drill, it just skates over the surface and you can't, can't get a grip on it. And that's showing that's the variability. But if you read the, the accounts at the time, they did have a lot of problems in getting the consistency uh, of the armour and at the end of the day some armour's better than no armour we were still building ships at a rate of knots and yeah. they were sucking up a lot of armour and this was vast amounts of relatively thin armour which were needed and we also were developing new techniques with it sometimes perhaps not as quickly as we should have done yeah. um, but we wanted to shape some of it and, and roll it and things like that and we were learning and so some of it was a bit rubbish to begin with so so i mean famously of course that you know uh, when we when, you, when people talk about t tank design the t34 always comes up you know the sloping uh, glasses um the, the cromwell there's lots of um, let's you know vertical surfaces, yep. big flat vertical surfaces. That if you're if you're firing a, an anti-tank weapon at at those surfaces, they're offering you exactly what you exactly what you want, which is a, a bit like a Tiger or a Mark IV. Well, like a Tiger or Mark IV, <laughs> but, but like a like a per, well well not but not a Panther. You know, a perpendicular surface to to, to strike. We un we understood sloped armour. Yeah, but I think we've Could got into it. this situation. Um, where we were making a design and it started off here and it ran on to the, the Centaur and then the Cromwell. And we knew how it all went together, but what we didn't really want to do was to close a whole factory or two factories down, retool, remachine, retrain all the staff to make one that was radically different. Mm. That's a key thing, isn't it? Well, no, of course, uh, it, well, no, all, absolutely. All the decision making process on, on absolutely. what you have and what you procure during a war. Yeah, oh, absolutely. But when you look at the, you look at the, the turret of the Cromwell with the bolts, Yep. Um, I mean, it, I mean, I, I, you know, it looks it, old school, doesn't it? It does look. It does look. I mean, it looks a little like a six-year-old. Most people don't realise they're McCormick. bolts. It's only when you realise they're bolts you think, really? So they're, they're the you know what we should do? We should, we, should, together. we should stop here and go, go and have a look at the, the turret. Okay, so we've moved away from the um, 
from the Cavalier and then the Centaur hulls yet to be restored and we uh, stood right now next to the turret of a Cromwell right mid re mid restoration you can really see the the, the width of the armor plate yeah here, you can't can see you? the great big flat horizontal what's vertical. that 50 millimeter do you know I've never measured it yes um it's two and a half inches covered. something two, like that two, it's two, uh, two and a half inches yeah and why is it all bolted and not welded? Um, it's the way they built these turrets at the time, and they weren't capable of casting them in one piece. Yes, because Sherman, Sherman's feature lots of cast armour, don't they? Yes. Uh, and, and, you know, the turret is, is, is a cast piece, and then they do the, the there is the cast, for, you know, there's the, there's the two different noses to the, or uh, uh, where the gearbox is, isn't it? Yeah. The, uh, um, there's the two different Sherman types. There's the one with the sort of the sort of bands with the bolts. Correct. Um, uh, look like they're holding the thing together. And it, it, would, it came down to what they could cast. Yeah. Um, and I've forgotten the chap's name, but there was a, a, a famous British engineer who was our casting guru, and he worked, I believe, on the Matilda turret and, yeah. and the nose and tail castings on the Matilda. Um, and uh, he was then sent over to the States, yep. um, I think very early in the war, to help out with the castings on the M3 tank and um, on the Sherman, firstly on the turret and then on the, uh, the main cast yeah. bodies. And then after that, he was sent over to Canada and helped them out on the Ram tank. Yeah, which is, the, which is a single-piece cast front. Yeah. The sort of bows of the tank are all, car are all cast, Correct. aren't they? And when it comes to casting, he's the man apparently and and so what happened was we ended up with this system of making turrets which by the standard of the end of the war was backward and so if you look at this you can see that the top is 20 millimeter plate yep. i have no idea why it was 20 millimeter rather than a british um Inch. imperial yeah, yeah um, bloody, bloody back off brussels yeah. that's right i think <laughs> <laughs> i think we we're on a three-quarter inch side plates yeah um and then once they'd made this lightweight inner turret they took these great big slabs of hardened armor um drilled holes through them tapped those holes so they were threaded and then uh, bolted the the big slabs onto the the inner carrier using these great big two and a half so inch bolts literally bolted together yeah literally I mean, I'm, bolted I'm on. on the inside so, of the so turret it's a here box a box that's been bolted together correct and they've got these big cast nuts that they then put on the outside and then just to be triply sure they welded a seam well yes because if a pack 75 or a pack 37 hits hits one of those potentially they fly right, off if inside they get you in the nuts so to speak it's going to ping around inside the turret the other side possibly yeah. I, mean, I mean, if you look inside out, you can see you can see here, you can see the the, the heads of the bolt. So they're kind of yeah. they're screwed on the other way around. If yeah, you yeah, 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 yes, yes, yeah, yeah. With the yes, nut the, on the, the outside. Yes, yeah, it's all heavy. The whole thing is, and the idea is just that. to put as as much metal between between you and the enemy as you can. And you can see this mantlet in here, which is cast, yeah. and and that's one piece. There's, a, there's another one on the floor behind you might be able to see. And the, mantlet, the mantlet's consistent across all British tank types, isn't it, essentially? They, they, essentially, it's the once same. Once they've got to the six-pounder, they, they make yep. the same mantlet. That's the same as they put on Churchill tanks. and Yeah, because yeah. they're, they're trying to do as many universal parts as possible. Aren't well, they? And I suppose the, the thing about a tank is a tank is an incredibly complex piece of kit, and what you want to do is make that complex kit as simple as you yeah. possibly yes. can. And, and you know that's the principle behind the Sherman and the and the Lee Grant and everything, isn't it? Yep. Is, is you have that kind of interchangeability of parts, and so that you you can have a kind of a, a light protector on a Jeep that you also have on a truck that you also yep. have on a Sherman that you know. And in the their own principle. way, they did this here. So the, the same the the, the different the sized principle. guns yeah. poking through the same hole. Um, interestingly, where the the bearings, the trunnions that that sits on, um, are then all covered over with steel plating. And the idea is that again, if they was a hit and it pops something off from the casting it won't damage the it won't quite mounting, so quickly yeah, yeah. go pinging around inside and killing everybody yeah, yeah. Um, but there are some things that we always wonder about so you've got this lovely turret here and then they've to, to make it fit the turret ring they've welded a slab on the side can't quite understand why they did it that way um, but it's just covering up the edge of the turret ring and you would have thought actually make the turret two inches wider on each side you could have used that space and you wouldn't have had to muck about welding slabs on the side crazy how, ex where's, how where's extraordinary the, I, I, I always wonder what that bulge sits. was yeah but where, where do you think the Cromwell sits in terms of kind of tanks of the war i mean you, you put it on your i love it because i well i well the th yes i mean i on the bovingdon video i did i you know i was trying to trying to annoy some people so i put it number one i thought it because because 
because it, it, I think it, it, if you put, if you push into all the cliches about tank design and tank building and uh, that that have dominated the way people have looked at the world, the Cromwell doesn't fit that story right. because it's quick. What um, can it once, do? 50, 50 miles an hour, forty-five miles an hour. Well, they, they're supposed to cap them, don't they? Yeah, 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 yeah. And there's that f- famous footage of one sort of jumping, isn't there? But yeah. But 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 it, you know. You, if you if you're lining this up against the Mark IV by this point is on its sort of last legs in terms of super development. It's got too heavy. It um, they put a great big turret and a great big gun on it to try and keep up. This is this by the time they get the six pounder right, so it can fire up, um, a heat round as well as a, uh, a another an APDS round. They have a Sabo round for this for the six pounder by by the end of forty four. By the time they've sort of figured all that out, this is as good as this is as good. I think it's as good a tank as. As any on the battlefield, in I, fact, I and would when you, agree. And when you get to the when you get to the breakout, and we were talking about cruisers, and we were talking about that, that that's exactly what this. Vehicle, that is what enables them to get to cover more miles they get than to the, the Germans do yeah, in May 1940, isn't it? Yeah, it's these these things are quick and reliable, and yeah, and people tend to fixate and. and James, we talked about it when we were talking about the 17-pounder anti-tank gun. People tend to fixate on um, the occasions when we went up against the, um, the, 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 the best that the Germans had to offer. But uh, the, this was never designed to fight Tiger tanks or Jagdpanthers Panthers or anything like no. that. It was uh, a medium tank. Yeah. And it was designed to cover all of those tasks which they were likely to... Well. Um, I, I think in I think in Normandy, I think the figure is something like tank on tank engagements accounted for seven percent of tank engagements. Yeah. yeah. In other words, the rest of the time you're firing at buildings, other targets, infantry, infantry, whatever yeah. it might be. You yeah. know, a whole host of things. So it's tank guns. The, you know, it, it's when you're thinking of tanks, you mustn't one mustn't think of them as a kind of tank on tank weapon. You know the key. The key weapon to take out tanks is the anti-tank gun, and that might be in a tank, but it might be in a, yeah. it might or be in a something tank else. hunter, but something specific. Yeah. Yes, that. or it That's might right. just be a gun like the like the seventeen pounder. But uh, but if you were an infantryman and you said and German and you're defending your piece of ground, and suddenly one of these is is coming round to your flank, um, if you haven't got a weapon that can deal with the tank, you need to get out of there and get out of there quickly. Yes. and that's how they were used. But, but the, or I mean, should think, have been used. But I think the reason I picked it is also because it because it it shows all the, it, it does show a mid evolutionary moment. It's like it's like that you know. It's like a dinosaur with feathers, isn't it? It's yeah. um, it's the it shows you where this is going, and the and the um, the fact that you then get comet, and then you get um, centurion. Centurion, you know, they send some to Belgium in '45, don't they? Sort of eight are sent to be sort of tried out, and, and again you come to this thing that no one knew the war was going to end in in May 1945. So no, so a, a tank arriving in in the European theatre in at that time isn't late it's it's actually it's bang on time if, if, if you see what i mean uh, because you, because if the war had gone on till the following christmas you'd have had centurions all over you know and well i think you made the i think it was you that made the really good point a, a month or two ago he was saying that, that you know britain's always kind of pushing stuff in six months ahead of what it wants to be yeah yeah, yeah. You, you know that you're, you're hurrying in because of necessity you know you've got something better down the road but you haven't got that yet so yeah. you've got to do what you yeah, yeah, yeah. The, do. The, the, the things never ever quite catch up um right uh, technologically with, with with the thing you need right this minute yes so it's like it, it is it is that thing of in six months you know in six months time you know if the war had gone on till till december 1945 it would have been centurions um yeah. everywhere and there'd, there'd have been no dealing with that if you were in your Jagd Panther or your... And uh, you've got Zyga to remember either. too and that... Versions, that of course. Yeah. I mean, if, if you look at the Cromwell, um, after the war, they were then upgunned. They were turned yep. into what they call charioteers with a much bigger turret, um, which some... The uh, 20 pounder on it. Yeah, the turret was quite a light affair, and one knowledgeable wag said it, it wasn't what he considered to be a second chance turret. Um, <laughs> but having said that, they sold them to a lot of the Arab countries. Um, Finland had a lot as well, and they went on, and they were they were still in action in the seventies. And that's not really, bad that's for a amazing. tank that was designed in nineteen forty one, forty two, and then gets rubbished. And and of course, um, uh, the Irish bought some, but they couldn't call them Cromwells. Um, that's all we. <laughs> that's that's all we have time for on this edition. Thank you very much, Tobin. Um, Pleasure. But there's going to be more from this. Oh yes, uh, this is just the beginning, it's like, people. It's like meeting Willy Wonka. <laughs>
<laughs> I've been called some things, but... <laughs> cheerio, see you next time. Yeah, cheerio.